Differentiating COVID-19 and influenza has become a key challenge for clinicians during the pandemic. Both influenza and COVID-19 are primarily transmitted through respiratory droplets or aerosols released through talking, sneezing, or coughing. However, COVID-19 appears to spread more readily than influenza. Recently, this finding has been most notable with the highly contagious SARS-CoV-2 Delta variant. The fatality rate associated with COVID-19 is significantly higher than that for influenza and follows an extremely steep age gradient. The older the individual, the higher the risk for hospitalization and fatality. For influenza, young children, especially those under the age of two years, and older adults are at highest risk for developing influenza-associated complications. Older age is also a primary risk factor for poorer outcomes in patients with COVID. For both conditions, patients with chronic medical conditions and those who are immunosuppressed are at higher risk for severe disease and complications. While many symptoms of COVID-19 and influenza overlap, key differences exist. With COVID, loss of taste and or smell is common, whereas this is not the case with influenza. In the pre-vaccine era, COVID presented much like influenza. However, COVID is changing phenotypically, and it can look a lot more like a common upper respiratory infection, particularly when it occurs in vaccinated individuals. COVID-19 can cause unique complications that are different from the flu, such as blood clots and multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. Although many patients with COVID recover within weeks of the initial illness, some individuals experience long COVID or long-haul COVID, with prolonged health issues lasting four or more weeks. Let's look at the antiviral medications available to us for treating influenza. Although there are six FDA-approved agents for influenza, currently only four are recommended by the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Oseltamivir, the most used noraminidase inhibitor, is indicated for treating patients two weeks of age and older. It can also be prescribed for influenza prophylaxis for patients aged one year and older. The newest recommended option is baloxivir, a CAP-dependent endonuclease inhibitor. It is currently indicated for the treatment and prophylaxis of influenza in individuals aged 12 years and older, including those at high risk for developing influenza-related complications. Baloxivir was first approved in 2018 for treating acute, uncomplicated influenza, based on findings from the Capstone 1 clinical trial, which enrolled otherwise healthy individuals. In 2019, the FDA expanded the indication for baloxivir to include patients at high risk for developing flu-related complications, based on the Capstone 2 trial in a higher-risk population. Upon reviewing data from the Blockstone trial, the FDA approved baloxivir for prophylaxis of influenza in 2020. We now have two oral options for chemoprophylaxis of influenza oseltamivir, and baloxivir. How do baloxivir and oseltamivir compare? Although both are oral medications approved for the treatment and prophylaxis of influenza, they have some important differences. Oseltamivir is given as a five-day course, and the medication is taken twice daily. It is available in capsule and liquid form. Baloxivir is a one-time dose. Baloxivir is not currently indicated for individuals younger than 12 years. Although data from the Mini-Stone 2 trial support the safety and efficacy of baloxivir in children aged 1 to 12 years, both agents are formally indicated for use within two days of symptom onset, but many clinicians will consider these medications beyond two days of illness duration for high-risk patients. Baloxivir appears to cause lower rates of the gastrointestinal side effects, namely nausea and vomiting, that have been reported with oseltamivir. Let's turn our focus now to COVID-19. Our current treatments and investigational therapies for COVID-19 can be aligned to three theoretical phases of immunopathogenesis. 
Stage 1 is largely asymptomatic, involving innate immune system activation and occurring during viral infection and proliferation. Stage 2 represents non severe symptomatic disease and activation of the adaptive immune system. In Stage 3, severe respiratory and inflammatory disease is present, accompanied by a cytokine mediated syndrome. Most people who are infected with SARS CoV 2 only reach Stage 2 before their illness resolves. But in the presence of certain risk factors, unfortunately, some people can progress to stage 3, characterized by hyperinflammation, immune-mediated coagulopathy, and organ damage, with an increased risk of death. Certain types of therapy, including antiviral therapy or monoclonal antibody therapies, are most useful for addressing the earlier phases of COVID. Anti-inflammatory or immunomodulatory therapies target those immune processes that occur in later phases of COVID pathogenesis and in individuals with more severe disease. Let's look at what we currently have in our toolbox for treating COVID-19. For non-hospitalized patients, monoclonal antibody therapies that directly attack the virus are recommended. Some current options include sotrovimab, Casarivimab, imdevimab, and bamlanivimab, etisevimab. EUAs and recommended use of monoclonal antibody therapies are subject to change based on circulating variants of concern and influx of new data on efficacy and safety. As of September 2021, these drugs are currently available under an emergency use authorization from the FDA. Monoclonal antibodies are a major step forward in the outpatient management of high-risk patients with COVID-19. However, obstacles to administration and uneven access to care present challenges. Additionally, monoclonal antibodies are vulnerable to escape variants, strains of the virus that no longer respond to certain monoclonal therapies. Options for patients hospitalized with COVID-19 include the antiviral agent remdesivir. It was approved by the FDA in October 2020 for treating patients aged 12 years and older. The corticosteroid dexamethasone is also commonly prescribed to help manage inflammation. Additional agents are available and recommended for treating certain patients hospitalized with COVID-19 under an emergency use authorization from the FDA. These include the interleukin-6 inhibitor tocilizumab, as well as the Janus kinase or JAK inhibitor baricitinib. Data regarding the optimal approaches for managing COVID-19 are constantly evolving and growing. The National Institutes of Health, NIH, and the Infectious Diseases Society of America, the IDSA, regularly convene panels to evaluate and make recommendations regarding optimal management strategies for COVID-19. Dexamethasone and or remdesivir are recommended for hospitalized patients with less severe disease. Baricitinib or tocilizumab is recommended for patients with rapidly increasing oxygen needs and systemic inflammation and should be added to therapy with dexamethasone or dexamethasone plus remdesivir. Influenza and COVID-19 can present with similar clinical manifestations, but treatment approaches are very different. Both are serious diseases, with the potential for associated complications and longer-term health effects beyond acute illness. To minimize patient morbidity and mortality, it is critical that clinicians stay up-to-date on the most current treatment options and practice recommendations.